Well, good morning to you. This is the Preterist Power Hour. It is our privilege to be here with you, to be your host of another hour of power, as we like to call it. I'm Mike Miano. I'm pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church. I am the director of the Power of Preterism Network, which this is a ministry provided through. You can learn more about that by visiting powerofpreterism.com. Uh, it's my privilege, of course, to be here with my co-host, Edward, who uh, I'll allow him to introduce himself here in a moment and lead us in a word of prayer. Uh, and I just want to remind everyone, uh, every Thursday, we mark this out as a throwback Thursday. It's an opportunity for us to review resources, talk about resources from the past. So uh, as you would imagine, we have a, a, a delightful program, an edifying program designed for you today. And I'm privileged to be here and to be the co-host. Good morning to you, brother. Good morning, Pastor. Thank you. My name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church, also a board member of the Power Predators and Network. And uh, at this time, I would like to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, please go before us. Give us a clarity of mind, thought, and proper focus that was presented today will uh, give insight to those with clarity where they can repeat it, share it with others, and develop fellowship you know, in the Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Brother, we are on the same wavelength this morning, I have to say. One of my things I wanted to start out talking about was the, uh, you know, when we talk about the power of preterism, the true expression of the power of preterism, let me find my notes here, the true expression of the power of preterism is found in those of us that find ways and methods and tact in bringing about, uh, you, you know, uh, talking with people, talking with our loved ones, and bring about further clarity for people. As you know, we often highlight uh, the, the goal of the Power of Preterism Network is to provide clarity, which comes by way of those ways of interaction, interacting with people and having conversations with people and, and helping clarify things that uh, people might be misunderstanding. So, um, you know, again, that is in my estimation how the power of preter preterism, uh, excuse me, uh, manifests itself is through us working toward having conversations with people, expressing things as simple as we can, speaking to people in ways they understand and uh, seeing the benefit and fruit thereof. So, uh, you know, matter of fact, Edward, if you don't mind, uh, on my time hop, again, that's my way of doing a throwback Thursday, if you will, I get to see the different things I posted throughout the years on social media. Today, four years ago, I wrote this thought, and I think this leans in on what we're saying here. Those whom persecuted the church were, were wicked and unreasonable. You can read that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2. Therefore, as his church, we endeavor to be righteous and reasonable. Again, you see the two opposites. You have wicked and unreasonable. Therefore, righteous would be the opposite of wicked and reasonable. We're, in, we're called to be a reasonable people because wickedness is highlighted as being unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say, Edward? Yes. And matter of fact, Vicki would appreciate this if she was here on our call. God is a reasonable God. Where, what do we read in Isaiah where it says, come and let us reason together? Uh, that's a text Vicki regularly brings up to me uh, in talking about salvation, of course. Uh, let us reason together and you'll, you know, I will make your garments as white as snow and you know, all those different beautiful metaphoric details of covenant life. And uh, matter another of fact, word, another word that's kind of related to reasonable is just. He's a just guy. Well, that's absolutely correct. You know, and we could go all around. You know, you know, I love one, one way of doing praise uh, for the nature and the uh, and who God is, in my estimation, is um, is going through the alphabet and listing, you know, the different attributes of God. And, you know, you can you can highlight all that because, again, it's. It's like a kaleidoscope, you, you know, it just keeps getting more and more beautiful as you twist and turn, uh, or yeah. I believe it's uh, William Bell who used the metaphor recently or a while back, matter of fact, uh, in regards to the resurrection, he said that it's like a jewel where, you know, you look at it in a diamond and you turn it and every facet glimmers in a different way due to yeah. the light that's looking, you know, gleaming upon it. So uh, again, I, I think that's the same thing with the way we look at the nature of God and who he is and how he expresses himself. So I want to highlight that we should be called to be a people. We are a people that are called to be righteous and reasonable, reasonable in our conversation, reason, reasonable in our ethic, uh, the way we bring forth our truths. And I praise God for those that find their ways, that pray and temper themselves and sanctify Christ in their heart to highlight the verse I talked about yesterday, uh, to sanctify Christ in your heart 
And then the text says, and be prepared to have an answer of those who ask of you, and which I believe requires living and talking in a manner that causes people to be interested in what you're saying so that they would ask questions. It doesn't say, as I, I think you had left the program yesterday, Edward, but I talked about that text in 1 Peter 3.15, where it says, sanctify Christ in your heart and be prepared to have an answer for those who ask of you. And I said, most people focus on the be prepared to have an answer or be prepared to, and then they insert, be prepared to preach. That's not what the text says. It says, sanctify Christ in your heart, seek, search, study, and prove the things of God, and then live in a manner that would call or speak in a manner that would cause people to want to ask questions. That's why it says, be prepared to have an answer for the questions people ask of you, the, the question of your hope uh, that people ask of you. So uh, the, what that, there's three parts to that. There's sanctify Christ in your heart. There's live in a manner that causes people to ask questions and st study to show yourself approved in a way that you will have an answer and also live a life that exemplifies the answer uh, to what people are looking for. Uh, you know, the, as Christ said, I come that you might have life and have it to the full. So I'm just praising God for that reality this morning. I thought that was a good throwback Thursday thought uh, that we are called to be a righteous and reasonable people in contrast to the wicked and unreasonable of 2 Thessalonians 3, 2 which also shows the way preterists would gain application. I hear people say sometimes, well, you're taking all the application out of the text. No, we're not. We're understanding the text as it is to who it was written to and then gaining application from it. And I think that's so important in everything that we listen to, that we think about, that we do is keep it in context. Amen? Amen. Uh, another thing I wanted to highlight, if you don't mind, uh, another thought that I shared on my social media this morning uh, from a brother named Kyle Jackson. He's a pastor in Fort Myers, Florida, or somewhere in that region, Southwest Florida. Uh, he had been a, a pa he had been a member of the church and then moved up into the, the pastorate of a church that I served at there in Fort Myers, Florida. And this morning he posted a, a very poignant thought, and I wanted to, to share it here. And it's don't get caught up with the unexplainable things of God, because you will miss out on the undeniable fact that he is good and real. And I think for a lot of people, they, they get caught up on all these other details in regards to, uh, you know, what happens when I die and go to heaven? What happens to this? What happens to that? And the unexplainable things. Uh, or, you know, some people have explained themselves out of believing in God, which sounds ludicrous, uh, because they focus so much on unexplainable things that they've missed the undeniable right in front of them. You know, as the phrase goes, you miss the, what is it? You miss the forest for the trees or miss the trees for the forest, something to that effect. <laughs> I think it's you miss the trees for the, either way. Oh, Again, you miss the value. Let's put it in plain English here. You miss the value of what it's, what's right in front of you because you're looking too far in the deep. You're not, you're not seeing the value of what's right there. And I think that's very important. A uh, matter of fact, one more comment I have to share. Uh, again, it's been an exciting morning here, um, as you'll notice as we go through the program. Uh, one more comment that I think you'd find interesting as well, Edward, is uh, talking about people sharing their faith and, and in jump, and, you know, getting in with tact and strategy in the ways that we can. By the way, I don't believe I completed the thought before. The goal of the Power of Preterism Network is to bring clarity, which again is that what we're, we were just highlighting, then healing and then strategy. Healing is ultimately seeing you know, before, for me, for example, I was getting I was getting ready for the end times and preparing to move to the mountains. Some people, their healing is that they actually began to care what the Bible says at all. Uh, you know, some people live a nominal Christian understanding where they ignore the inconvenient truths and, you know, just kind of live what they understand. And then when they learn about preterism, it creates this, this attitude of, wow, I have to kind of develop a healthy Christian worldview. I have to find consistency in my understanding of the Bible, which we're going to lead in on today. Um, so I, I praise God that we find these moments where we can interact with people and help them challenge, you know, with strategy, again, highlighting that last point there, uh, once we gain the clarity and the healing, uh, we strategize on ways that we can bring forth this truth. And I, I praise God for those that do this on the regular basis. Uh, and I know many close to me, you, Edward, I know people at our church, Rashonda, she's been uh, someone that's been very zealous to want to share certain things and hear her, you know, her, her friends and her sisters in Christ and uh, their, their understanding of, 
uh, of certain biblical truths, especially pertaining to preterism, being that this is the preterist power hour. That being said, this morning, I saw a post on social media where a couple local preachers here on Long Island, they were having conversation amongst each other about post or pre-tribulation. And somebody commented this. I'm not going to put this person's name out there, but I just want you to hear the conversation that developed. Preterists believe he returned in AD 70. Hyper-dispensationalists predicted 88 reasons why he is coming in 1988. My opinion is we aren't going to see anything as far as the parousia is concerned in our lifetime. Eschatology is so subjective to denominational doctrine. It will literally make my head spin. I live for Jesus now. So whatever it is, I'm confident in him. Done. Now, I want you to notice what my comment was, and you probably already understand how I went about this. I said, that would be the preterist ethic. That's what we're saying, that we have everything in Christ. That is the parousia, that his presence is with us now. And we can, to quote uh, this, this gentleman, I live for Jesus now. So whatever it is, I'm confident in him. Again, because we understand what has been provided. Now, this is the point where I urged him toward thought. I said, your relaxed nature, if you believe he is coming, he is yet to come, is far different than the idea the New Testament writers had and how they urged their recipients regarding the immediacy of his coming. So for a Christian today, and Edward, you've seen this, a lot of futurists, to use that phrase, a lot of futurists live their lives. They'll say, well, I live a life for Jesus today. I'm just, I know he's going to come one day and I'm not that worried about it. Well, <laughs> if he's coming, you, you should be worried about it because that's the way the writers wrote in the New Testament. Uh, that, you know, you, you should be, it should be a concern. Whereas the lackadaisical effort ethic today within futurist camp almost reeks of non-belief and lack of knowledge or ignorance for that matter. What do you think? Yes, and I don't because that, you know, if, if, if they're waiting, if they're waiting for Christ to, to return, they have to be, you know, on their toes, ready to flee and things of this nature. Uh, because those that, that think peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them. So that's if they have that, if they have that belief, you know? So, and then I was thinking about application as you were mentioning, um, that we have to be that example of how to probably apply scripture because what people do, they, they exegete certain um, passages out of the scripture to, uh, to meet, whatever issue in which they're uh, trying to remedy, which many a times is out of context. So what they have to do, have to learn is like you had described is learn the context of the scripture, how, what it meant to the first century people, right? And then apply application, how it may apply. Now okay. only we can do that because we have that understanding. So when we give an answer, or when we are in discussion, we're uh, exemplifying that through our discussion, you know? So when questions may arise due to the discussion in which we're having, we can have an answer. Amen, amen. Um, you know, that, that is the goal, that, that we wanna to study to show ourselves approved. We wanna sanctify Christ in our heart. We wanna live lives that understand the things of God and comprehend the things of God so that we might exhibit the things of God. So uh, amen, Edward, thank you for highlighting that. And um, that kind of helps me lead in on our topic today. So what I wanted to do, being that it's a throwback Thursday, is I wanted to just bring up a topic that we've talked about before and lead in on some resources that I've provided for, uh, for your edification. So uh, many of you know, we, we had a talk with Tim Martin. We talked with Jeff Vaughn as well, the co-authors of Beyond Creation Science, and that was a part of our preterism and Genesis creation discussion. And uh, we had promised that we're going to we're going to return back to that conversation and welcome on other guests that will lead into that conversation. And um, we're going to do that. However, uh, one of the other promises was the sermons by Tim Martin. And uh, I went ahead and I created a WordPress site, uh, timmartinteaches.wordpress.com. And what I'll be doing every Saturday, today you get a freebie, uh, every Saturday I'll be uploading a, a new sermon of his uh, every Saturday for people's edification, Saturday night or Sunday morning, however you choose to do that. And um, we'll also be working on eventually a resource on the Power of Preterism Network for Preterist Weekends, which will include various sermons 
from uh, different preterist teachers and preachers and pastors for that matter. Um, also ways that you can be a part of interactive church. Uh, there's different sessions that are done. Uh, Cindy Coates does The Porch live on Facebook and usually streams that through her Facebook page, The Porch. Uh, then we're working on some interactive ideas here at the Blue Point Bible Church to have Blue Point Bible Church online, as I appreciate, Edward, you're regularly bringing up our online community. Uh, so uh, we do pray for that and we work toward uh, being a, a blessing to the online community in that regard. So we're working on some of those details. Then, um, so the Tim Martin resource is available and we'll be making that available through the Power of Preterism Network Facebook page and sharing some resources on the blog, especially as we look to some conversation toward uh, covenant creation and, and Genesis creation uh, to review that topic again. So uh, again, that sermon's up. And the reason I bring it up is in that sermon that I, we just uploaded, I, I've uploaded the uh, God's Garden series. That's what we're starting with. Figure it's the beginning of your Bible. Why not start there? So uh, I've uploaded the first sermon of that series. And what Tim gets in on right from the very beginning is, and I think this is just as important as preterism, because again, that was the goal of beyond creation science was to say, now that we've seen the power of preterism, let's see how this ethic of audience relevance of, you know, historical context uh, and, and gaining application after we understand what it meant in its original context. Uh, how does that apply to Genesis? How do we carry that through in a biblical narrative? And um, so Tim's sermon, for that matter, he gets in on that. He talks right, right from the very beginning that one of the biggest problems we're seeing with young people, for example, uh, leaving the Christian faith is that they've, they have not been shown with consistency the story, the biblical narrative from Genesis to Revelation. And a lot of the interpretations that have been offered are lacking and have caused more confusion and questions than clarity. And uh, that's something that the, the book Beyond Creation Science was endeavoring to help clarify. So the sermon series, matter of fact, that I was just mentioning as well, uh, that's what Tim's leading in on, is he's helping you understand this picture of God's garden. For example, uh, Edward, we're, we're studying here at the Blue Point Bible Church about the wilderness. Now you see the wilderness is the desert. That's not a garden. That's not where water is abundantly supplied to you. That's, you, you know, that's not where fruit and trees are going to grow and flourish uh, you know, for your, your benefit. So you see the contrast, and I'm sure you see it as well, between a garden and the wilderness, the desert, the wastelands uh, that are marked out throughout scripture. Now, if we misappropriate those things, we end up highlighting things talking about the afterlife and heaven and all these strange notions that people have offered up rather than understanding that language to be talking about covenant and you know God's relationship with his people uh, as when he's in good harmony with them, it's as if they're living in Eden. Matter of fact, I think it's the prophet Hosea that highlights that. Whereas when, the, when God is not happy with them, or when not, not necessarily when God's not happy, when God is loving them with discipline, let's call it that, he leads them to the wilderness, brings them to a wasteland. And, and that's the, the, the two depictions, if you will. Uh, and then matter of fact, the, obviously the wasteland can lead to your death. And then you become, uh, as I was listening to Tim talk about this morning in that sermon, Ezekiel 37, you become a valley of dry bones. You know, now it's not just the wasteland around you. Now you're a part of the wasteland, uh, being dry, dead bones. Uh, and that's what we see the story of Israel, the narrative of Israel. Is that making sense to you, Edward? Yes. And I was also thinking, you know, the, the, the wilderness being a, a, a time of purging, uh, 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 going through the, the fire to be refined uh, through testing and um, developing your relationship with God at that particular time. That's what it should be, you know. Uh, for those that uh, do not trust in God, then they kind of like fall into being blended in with the uh, desert or the wasteland. That's right. And if you remember, that's sort of what Reese Maggard was getting in on the other day in our discussion for another throwback conversation there. Um, I'll be putting up a resource that'll give everybody access to that interview and some other resources that we mentioned during that interview. However, my point here is Reese Maggard was highlighting that the hell we read about in the scripture is oftentimes a purifying picture of God, you know, purifying his people rather than what Christians have tried to highlight, you know, or not even only Christians of many people have tried to highlight that, uh, that, you know, hell is this picture of torment, of eternal torment. Again, we don't worship a God that, that, that eternally torments people. He does, he brings forth judgment with a purpose to restore his people, to bless his people, to discipline his people. 
Uh, and that judgment might be seen to those that are not his people uh, as wrathful and as you know angry. Uh, however, we know that, as we talked about, I believe a couple of weeks ago, uh, that we believe we're saints in the hands of a loving God. That you know that discipline. Uh, and Edward, I actually got that from you. You know, it was your conversation that uh, at Bible study that ultimately gave me that sort of moniker that you know, saints in the hands of a happy God, in the hands of a loving God. Let's get it right. Um, so thank you, and I pray that. The way I've packaged that blesses you as well. Amen. So uh, again, I mentioned the sermon, and I think the sermon leads in on exactly what we're talking about, or what I want to talk a little bit about for the next uh, half hour, if you will, is chapter 21 of Beyond Creation Science. Uh, it's the chapter about the Christian worldview. Now, uh, unfortunately, Edward, uh, you've probably noticed this. When people talk about Beyond Creation Science or Covenant Creation, most of the time, the conversation is around the details. It's around, you know, uh, what we're saying about Genesis 1-4 or the lights here or that, this and that. And uh, rather than really understanding the ethic of what covenant creation is getting at. So for me, this is one of the most important yet most, uh, I can't find the right word I want to say here, the most unread, the most uh, least resourced chapter of the book that, you know, people seem to kind of gloss over because everybody assumes they have a Christian worldview. And I think this chapter helps us get a handle on that. So uh, being that we were talking about clarification and helping provide clarity, I'm hoping that the resources that we're leaning in on this morning, uh, Tim Martin's sermon, uh, the book Beyond Creation Science, this chapter particularly, chapter 21, uh, will lend toward that clarity that we're, we're aiming at. Amen? So we will find this to be foundational that will lead us in through uh, the biblical narrative. That's right. Matter of fact, a resource I think I should mention is we did a study uh, through Beyond Creation Science. I think I've read the book at least six times now. Um, I've you know taught a study in person, taught a study online. We had a group discussion. You could avail yourself those videos by going to YouTube, putting put in Beyond Creation Science online study, uh, put in my name or something to that effect, and you'll be able to find those videos. I'll share the resource in a blog update as I post about Tim Martin's sermons and different things. I'll help people get the outlines that we've provided, because what we did in our study was we went through every chapter and we took the subtitles and we, we marked them out and then went through each of those subtitles and studied out the details and created group conversation, which I thought was very edifying. And uh, again, so, you know, this, I think it's important to avail yourself to those resources uh, and I'll make sure I share them uh, as a throwback Thursday, if you will. But one thing that the chapter begins with that I want to be uh, start out with here is this, the full Christian worldview can only be reestablished by returning to the biblical standard for truth, the testimony of many witnesses. So again, what we're seeing here and then what they're getting in on is the mutual friendship between theology and modern science that, you know, they don't need to be diametrically opposed, which unfortunately has confused a lot of people rather than lend it toward clarity. And what this requires is a humility, is, you know, a willingness to admit there's things we don't know there is a willingness to admit there's things that scripture is not speaking about, a willingness to admit that we can theorize, but we have to call them theories. Uh, we can philosophize, if you will, uh, but we have to call it philosophy. Uh, we, you know, the mind of man thinking upon theology, but not theology itself. So, uh, you know, that's important. So we often refer to that as a thinking faith here at the Blue Point Bible Church. And, uh, you know, that's our way of saying that we're free to think about things as long as we're thinking about things. You know, hopefully you catch the power of that. We're free to thinking about things as long as we're thinking about things. And, you know, if you stop thinking about things, then no, your, your closed-minded thought that's not further thinking, no, you're not free to do that. We, and I don't personally, a lot of times I don't want to hear it. If, you know, you're free to think if you're thinking. You're free to share if you're thinking. If you're not thinking, you're dying. You're going backwards. You're boxed in. And your thoughts create more confusion than clarity. So uh, that being said, one of the things Deacon Ed uh, mentioned here, Deacon Ed Silsby mentioned at the Blue Point Bible Church during this Bible study, was that what we're offering a lot of times through good theology is a reset on bad theology. And that's what we often say here. We're helping people unpack the, the, the baggage uh, of tradition, the baggage of personal interpretation, uh, helping people unpack that and put on new you know, the truth, put on the true armor of God, which is, you know, the truth of God as made known through the scriptures and the spirit of God. Amen. Amen. 
I'm in an amen mood today, brother. I'm in a pen. I got a Pentecostal spirit about me. So uh, pardon the <laughs> constant assertion there. Uh, so here in this chapter, uh, there's the outline, if you will. I think this is good to provide some clarity. Uh, the outline regarding a Christian worldview would be the Bible. You know, what are we saying about the Bible since we just marked out that that's the source? Uh, then what are we saying about creation and human life? Uh, which also includes what we're not saying. Uh what are we saying about life in God's kingdom? Then we're going to lead in on, of course, because this is the Preterist Power Hour, the time perspective. Uh, we think that's very important, and we're going to see what the book has to say about that. And then missions and evangelism in the kingdom, the Christian apologetic, as we started out talking about uh, 1 Peter 3.15, uh, and then, of course, unity in God's church. And I thought that was a very good outline to a Christian worldview. Those are the things that should be important. I know. Uh, Gary DeMar has often asked, you know, for a foundational worldview uh, provided from the full preterist community. And I've often emailed him and mentioned chapter 21 of Beyond Creation Science. It's right there in front of you, if, if not the scriptures, of course. But this chapter helps outline a good, consistent worldview of what the subtitle of Beyond Creation Science is, the new covenant creation from Genesis to Revelation. What was the mystery and ultimately what is the reality? So, Edward, anything you want to say before I start bringing us into a little bit of a review of these subtitles? No, I would like to get right into the... All right, cool. Well, all right, so let's talk about this. And I know you have to get going soon, Edward, so you're probably only going to have time for this first subtitle. Let's talk about the Bible. Now, you know, and as you've mentioned, part of your testimony is, you know, prior to coming here at Blue Point and being given sort of a foundation to how do we put together these pieces of the Bible, you had often said that, you know, you understood it, a bunch of stories, you know, you understood the, the details of those stories well, but you didn't understand and didn't put together how they fit into this larger biblical narrative. Is that a good assessment? A very good assessment. Good deal. I try to listen to you, brother, and understand where you're coming <laughs> from. I think that's important. Amen. So the common view is that the Bible is a bunch of pieces. And as you probably heard many people say, is they do this, uh, it's a proposition of do's and don'ts. You know, it's rules and doctrines, if you will. Uh, and that's what a lot of people treat the Bible like. You know, well, the Bible says, the Bible says you can't do this. The Bible says, you know, in a lot of quoting of scriptures, many of you have heard my uh, frustration with the Jeremiah 29, 11 crowd. Uh, you know, just it's not so much what's being said, but how it's being used out of context uh, that frustrates me. So the common view is that the Bible is a, a bunch of propositions of rules and doctrines. You know, this is what the Bible teaches about who Jesus is. This is what the Bible teaches. Whereas when you know, open up the Bible, Edward, and you know this, we get in on some stuff that if you start marking out do's and don'ts, like one of my frustrations with people is they fail to understand, and this is what this chapter got at uh, in the Beyond Creation Science as well, was they fail to understand the narrative of the scriptures, the continuity of the Old and the New Testament. And that becomes confusing for a lot of folks. So... Uh, Edward, what would you say in regards to the Bible? What do you think a good, healthy ethic is in regards to understanding the Bible uh, from a full preterist, uh, covenant creationist, I believe you would identify as such, a view? I, I would suggest that you allow the Bible to say what the Bible is saying. Hmm. You know, uh, the uh, focus not on the minutia of, of these little details that people are questioning. You know, don't come with questions. You know, just read the Bible and get the context of what the Bible is actually saying. And then if you have questions, the question should be pertaining to what the Bible is, has, has told you, you know, uh, and then you're in context, you know, with scripture. Uh, uh, with our own ideas, you know, uh, if you look through Bible history, biblical history, you know, the, the failure of the Israelites is when they come to their own understanding of things, of how they want things to fit in their paradigm. See, that, that has been their fault. You know, and, and we're duplicating that by coming with our own presuppositions and questions that the Bible has to fit. You know, mm -hmm. We are to fit into what the Bible is saying and, what, and, the, and the messages of the Bible you know, to give us proper application on what Okay, if you want to go into do's and don'ts, you know, the basic don't is uh, uh, is to trust in God 
and if you don't trust in God, then you have difficulty. Hmm. <laughs> you know, that's the only thing that you don't want to, you know, do. That's right. And, you know, in that regard. I think that's a good point because that, that brings us to what that should bring us to is to our knees. That should humble us. It should make us realize if God is, if God is right and I am wrong or man is wrong for that matter, it causes humility. It causes me, you know, it's not so much. And, and I'll say it like this. It's not so much that questions aren't welcome and preconceived thoughts aren't welcome, but they need to be tested. They need to be, you know, and we need to be humble enough to say, should my view and can my, where can my view be tested? And if your view cannot be tested, it's not a good view. It's not a solid view. You know, if you're not welcoming people to kind of poke at it a little bit and, you know, play around with the idea, then maybe you need to ask yourself why you're so insecure about the view that you have. You know, so, uh, you know, I think it's important to have a humility to say that I'm not right. I've, you know, I'm not right all the time. I've been wrong before. I can be wrong. I want to inquire. I want to seek, search, study, improve to be right. But I think you also highlighted another good point, Edward, in regards to have informed questions. In other words, sit down and listen for a little bit and then ask questions as per you receive the information, not yeah. just immediately jumping in and having questions per your view. That's the problem with preconceived notions. Yes. Anything you want to end with, brother? I know you got to run. Real fast. Our views many a times uh, needs to be developed because our views of what we've been exposed to, you know, uh, like uh, there was a preacher or someone had said something to the effect that you don't want to get a uh, Bible interpretation through, um, through the dictionary and things of this na nature. Um, you want to get the Bible interpretation from the Bible because the Bible has explanations of words and meanings differ from the, the dictionary. <laughs> Right. That's right. Yeah, that was uh, our brother Steve Bazden there. He, Steve Bazden, yes. in the debate, right? He mentioned the, uh, the point that, um, I don't know that I would say, but let me qualify something. I know some people get in on me about the brother thing. I use brother very loosely. Uh, you know, Steve Bazden, let's be, let's be clear. Steve Bazden's not interested in being my brother in Christ because I haven't jumped through the hoops that he thinks are necessary. In my estimation, that is an unapproved message from an unapproved man, uh, you know, in that regard. So I did want to qualify that. I know some people have been confused in that regard. Uh, I use brother at more of a loose term, a loving term. I don't know who my brother is. And as I posted after somebody mentioned that to me, I said, do we, you know, as those who believe in the election of God, I would say, because somebody doesn't believe in the election and they don't believe I'm their brother, does that mean that they're not elected or that they're not my brother? Just something to ponder there. Uh, you, you know, we don't know that. So I'd rather be on the wrong side of calling somebody my brother than on the wrong side of saying somebody was not my brother and be, uh, and be wrong about that. So uh, I think that demonstrates the love of God anyway. Um, so Steve Bazden did mention, Edward, and I appreciate you bringing that up, that, you know, we want to get our definitions from the scriptures and highlight the details uh, that highlight the details that uh, the scriptures teach that word or that topic to be about. Obviously, we've been leading in on resurrection. Thank you, brother. Go in peace. We've been leading Thank in on resurrection. We want to allow that to be, uh, you, you know, the point. Uh, we believe that to be the point of how you get good interpretation is allowing the text to say what it says and then getting your interpretation from that. I believe that's exactly what Edward was leading in on there. So uh, let's move a little bit further. Uh, we talk about the Bible. And again, I, I think that we, we've highlighted a very simple truth that rather than teaching the Bible with verses here, proof texting here, proof texting there, the one thing the preterist ethic should be teaching us uh, is that we understand it to be a story and we need to understand the story in context, including the details in context and uh, stop with the uh, citation of Old Testament texts and trying to force them into the New Testament reality. Uh, there's a right and a wrong way to do that. And uh, we need to be cautious. Matter of fact, I'll be preaching about that at an upcoming conference uh, in April, uh, April 23rd or 23rd through the 24th. I'll share the graphic here in a moment uh, in Alabama, Sullivan, Alabama at Prospect Baptist Church. So I'll be talking about that infusion of Old and New Testament reality into our, our present Christian kingdom lives and uh, how we should be doing that and handling that. Uh, so I haven't quite framed the, the topic yet or the way I want to organize it. So pray for me and look forward to the discussion. The next subtitle here in this chapter is Creation and Human Life. And what they did, I appreciate it, was they gave us the common view and then the, the proper view. We mentioned the common view of the Bible being presuppositions of the rules and doctrines. 
uh, and the proper view being a narrative of God's redemption of his people. Creation and human life, uh, most people focus, make it the focus uh, the, about physical universe and creation, a physical human creation. Whereas the proper view would be, and I'm going to quote here, the natural focus of Genesis, uh, the creation account is a powerful unveiling of the meaning and essence and goal of covenant life between God and man. Ultimately, we see in the garden picture that work is good, that marriage is a divine order and has great blessing, uh, that children are, multi uh, are to be seen from a multi-generational perspective. This is something we see right there from that garden scene. And again, I mentioned that series that Tim is uh, teaching through, uh, that Tim teaches, uh, Tim Martin teaches that wordpress.com uh, because he gets in on that exact topic. So uh, that's what the, the covenant creation view, if you will, is offering up in regards to creation in human life is that we see these essentials. We see that uh, work is good. We see that marriage is, is a divine order and it has great blessing behind it. We see that children should be seen from a multi-generational perspective. And that becomes the ethic, the application of a healthy view of creation in human life as per Genesis for the covenant creationist. Uh, then of course, talking about life in God's kingdom and as preterists, we know it, you know, it has Christ come in his kingdom or not? Is the kingdom here? Is it somewhere else? Is it ethereal? Is it only gonna happen when the earth is restored? There's so many confusing answers from the futurist community. Yet the preterists offer up that we are in God's kingdom. And again, what I call Revelation 21 through 22 reality. A couple of quotes here from this chapter. One of preterism's most conclusive conclusions is that God's kingdom has been established on planet earth. The kingdom has come, but only those in Christ can see it. And this was an allusion to John chapter three, uh, those that you know are born again are born from above to use the proper language uh, to go on another quote here the story of israel's kingdom is parallel to the story of the kingdom of god the physical kingdom was a shadow of christ's kingdom and you see uh, some citations would be first kings chapter 8 verse 56 where israel god had fulfilled all the promises to israel and they began to live and flourish i'm often so perplexed when i hear people say things like well if all has been fulfilled what do we have now what are we doing now how do we live now? Just read the Bible. The Bible tells you what happens when God fulfills the promises to his people. There's a difference in the way that we're living in the new covenant because we're not living under the law of Moses, that rather we're living in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. So th there's obvious difference in the kingdom, but there is a parallel that needs to be understood. And matter of fact, I'm working on a book, uh, I've mentioned this before, Kingdom Kings, and I'll be doing an examination of the old covenant kings of Israel and ultimately how we should be living as kings and priests in the kingdom of God today. Uh, in 1 Kings 8.56, as I mentioned, uh, the promises had been given. The people were living blessed under the kingdom of David. We see the same thing under the kingdom of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 20. And uh, again, just important texts. Uh, or matter of fact, I think I have that backwards. It's David and uh, Solomon in 1 Kings 8.56 and David, I think, in 1 Kings 4.20. Either way, both of those texts highlight fulfilled promises, living at the pinnacle of the kingdom of God. And, and this is what ultimately the preterists are saying, uh, living in the increase of Christ's government uh, that would never end, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Uh, this is, the you know again, the, the ethic that the preterist community is offering up. Uh, one of the things they say in Beyond Creation Science is the practical implications of the kingdom of kingdom life are many. The victorious kingdom of God gives children. They go on a a large portion there talking about that. Uh, when uh, we we'll give children, when growing up in Christianity, something to live for. Sorry, to, let me properly complete that thought. The victorious kingdom of God gives children who grow up in Christianity something to live for. And that time perspective is so important. That actually is the next subtitle in that chapter. If you think about it, uh, futurism offers a meager time perspective. Now, again, if you want to live the lackadaisical preterist, uh, futurist life, if you will, where, again, I highlight that quote that I mentioned earlier in our program, where it's, you know, uh, you know, Jesus is coming, but I I'm just going to focus on the kingdom now. Well, that's a very inconsistent reality with what we're reading in the New Testament. Um, and also this time perspective, you know, why would I start a business that I want to have generationally and pass down generally, generationally, if I believe that the Lord is imminently coming? And on that post that I mentioned just this morning, I saw on social media, group of local preachers, going through this whole uh, discussion about, you know, what we know that the Lord is coming is imminent, whether you believe post-trib, pre-trib, mid-trib, you know, no-trib, amillennial, whatever you want to do, uh, all these different views, 
um, as long as you know the Lord is coming, which offers a meager time perspective. And you have a short past, you have a short future uh, as per the, you know, let's say, um, what's that young earth? And then you combine that with dispensationalism, you have short past, short future. And it just becomes a problem. I want to share with you uh, what they say here in the book in regards to imagine what will happen. I'm just going to go ahead and read it to you. Bear with me one moment here. Imagine what will happen when the old earth creationist time perspective of the past unifies with the preterist time perspective of the future. This will be a revolution within Christianity. The recognition that our earth has been here for millions of years and will be here for millions of years will prompt Christians to, to think deeply about the future. This will change the way Christians live out their own faith. Christians will inevitably become more future oriented and think, plan, and work for this long future rather than dwell slothfully in the shadows of a supposed imminent end of history. Christian goals must be, they go on to say, Christian goals must be wider, longer, and deeper than modern Christians dominated by young earth futurism can currently conceive. Covenant creation and covenant eschatology full preterism for that matter, rep can revolutionize our time perspective. Our world has been around for a long, long time and will continue to be around for a long, long time. I know that always gets me into these conversations about uh, that scientific theory of what is it, the law of thermo thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics or something to that extent. And my usual response to that is rather simple. God created the world, God can sustain the world. So uh, even if it takes miraculous intervention, uh, which I, I don't know that that will be necessary, However, uh, I do believe that. So uh, the time perspective changes everything. I love there's another portion in this chat book. I think it's actually the next subtitle where they get in on having a thousand year ethic to reach uh, the Muslim community. You know, what would that look like if we we didn't we got stopped going over there with this haste makes waste gospel and, uh, you know, converting souls, so to speak, that don't understand a lick of the scriptures or, or any of that. And it's not to impugn upon those efforts, but to highlight some of the problems that have been manifest from short-term missions and uh, these haste makes waste evangelism. If you're going to do a short-term mission, I was a short-term missionary to Israel, Palestine uh, back in 2010. I was there for three weeks, three to four weeks, and I journaled every day and I went and I met with different, I was a part of a group, Christian peacemaker teams, and went with and met with different groups of people and talked, conversed, learned ways of life. I had an influence perfectly as a Christian, uh, encouraged people and, and worked toward obviously developed the website you can learn more about that. Matter of fact, visit with Risky Business, Risky Business for Christ. Weebly.com. I'll share that later as a throwback Thursday. And I just had the opportunity recently to strategize. Again, we talked about that at the beginning of the program. I had opportunity to strategize and talk about, uh, you know, that missionary trip in regards to eschatology uh, with somebody more recently. So, what would it look like to just take our time in missions? And uh, if we have the time perspective, we can then go about doing that. And rather than this haste makes waste, judgment is coming gospel. Uh, then they talk about that. And the, the next subtitle is missions and evangelism in the kingdom. One thing they said that I appreciate, or there's a whole bunch of things, but two quotes I'll give you from this portion here. Uh, New Christians need to be trained to live in terms of God's kingdom now as immigrant citizens of the New Jerusalem. They go on to say the Christian goal for missions must be nothing less than the complete conversion and evangelism of our entire planet, helping people understand the truth of Jesus Christ. The matter of fact, I'll share with you one more thought from this portion on page 435 of the book. It says, preterism provides the theological framework and time perspective necessary for the accomplishment of an amazing goal the conversion of our entire planet Earth to Christ by the power of the Christian gospel. Now, of course, that means that we have to get the Christian gospel correct. We have to understand what we're telling people, why we're telling people it, and we can have our nuances. Again, I hope that we've developed that ethic here uh, with you know what we're doing, especially through the Power of Preterism Network, is that we can have our nuances and we can be comfortable with our distinctions. You know, we we've been talking with primitive primitive Baptist Universalists. Uh, I'm not considered a primitive Baptist Universalist. I consider myself a non-denominational uh, Christian preacher. You know, I believe in in, in certain distinctives of Scripture. Uh, I don't make that the, the highlight of my work, whereas I make the kingdom of God the highlight of my work and, and what God is doing 
in areas that I might not be in agreement. You know, I'm working on a write-up where I want to talk about what if Mark never left Paul? You, you know, there's things that wouldn't have gotten accomplished because they did see things different. And I'm sure they both had two different perspectives on what happened, uh, you know, and how they would explain that to different people. They didn't ostracize and start telling each other that they weren't Christian uh, because of it. So, you know, and later on, look what happened. They were able to unify. So there's so much power in just that truth alone. Uh, and I believe, uh, you know, having an understanding of what we're saying, matter of fact, I'll just share a quote from this subtitle here, the Christian apologetic. Preterism offers the complete refutation of many, many modern cults because it demonstrates the error of futurism upon which the cultic systems rest. And then it goes on to say here, uh, as Christians accept preterism, in the future, they will be in a position to show the liberal, the conservative, the atheist, the Muslim, and other unbelievers, what Jesus predicted did not, did come true exactly when and how he promised. Preterism turns the most common arguments against Christianity into powerful evidence for the truth of Christianity, which will be more self-refutation, which, I'm sorry, which will be more effective in the long run, a Christianity that boldly proclaims its own self-refutation or a Christianity that provides an intellectually satisfying view of things from Genesis to Revelation. Only a faith that makes sense can convert the world to Jesus Christ. That brings me back to my beginning thought for that matter uh, in regards to being a people of that are reasonable, righteous and reasonable, righteous by his means, of course, his righteousness. I used to always assert that uh, Matthew 6, 33, you, you know, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be provided to you. So if we live righteous through him and we're reasonable, that can lead to the true Christian apologetic. Preterism will enhance the Christian apologetic greatly in the year, years and generations to come. And this in turn will lead to the growth of God's kingdom over the long term. And again, I know some of you are probably already seeing this and it'll also lead to unity. And that's what they get at. Uh, they talk about on uh, the last subtitle here, preterism changes the theological context of the discussions and leads naturally to new questions and new perspectives on deeply entrenched debates. And last quote, progress is hard work and tends to be messy. Perfectly, we're leading in that. Uh, one of the goals of the Power of Preterism Network is to uh, be on the front lines of reformation and revival, uh, which we believe is, is happening in our day, and we're, we're seeing it, and we're excited to be participating in it. That's not to say that it wasn't happening in generations prior. It was. The church is to be an ever-reforming institution, and I believe that we're just continuing that effort, and praise God for our part in it. So uh, that being said, I know I have some of you here in our session. I'll unmute uh, mics if anybody wants to contribute. Uh, Zach, Richard, uh, please feel free to jump on in and uh, share any conclusive thoughts before I close us out in a word of prayer. Hey, Richard. Good morning. Yeah, hi. Um, a couple of things. If you check some of your graphics, you do have the wrong Zoom number on some of your graphics. Do check I? the latest. Check the latest ones on your timeline under the Power Preterism Network. You'll see what I mean. Because I, I was on another machine this morning and it threw me off again. Um, so uh, just check that. Um, right. I have good news. Jonathan Mitchell uh, is willing uh, to be on the show. Great. Uh, for those that don't know, Jonathan Mitchell has written. He, he's of a preterist persuasion, and he has written a New Testament and commentaries on the New Testament. By, you, uh, by studying Greek and coming out with all of the nuances of the Greek words and so forth and so on. And some of this stuff is even available in PDF for free if um, somebody perhaps can't afford it. And uh, in fact, I had the, um, as a prelude, I thought somebody might want to take a look at some of his work. So I, I posted in the public chat, I don't think they can see it on the internet, um, the link to his website and I'll, I'll give it to those that maybe can't see it. It's Jonathan Mitchell, New Testament, all one word, dot com. And you'll see that there, Jonathan, note the spelling is not J-O-H-N, it's J-O-N, Jonathan, Mitchell, New Testament, dot com. And it's also in the text for those that are watching. Or, I don't know, can they see that uh, the, when I post in the chat? On, no, uh, not on, online. The people okay. here, me, you, and Zach can see it right now. Okay, all right. Um, so I wanted to mention that uh, he, do, he does do both. He has a New Testament and then he has commentaries on the New Testament. So you can see a lot of the research that went into his thinking uh, as to why he wrote 
you know, translated those verses the way he did. This is a deep study Bible. This is not for somebody who just wants to read, you know, a book a week or, you know, this is not that kind of thing. This is like one verse and you're there for 10 minutes. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you know, you know what I mean with that, right? Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure you do. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to, you know, share that news with you and for other people because he is routinely quoted on um, on Facebook in many different forums. Great. Uh, so that uh, I've been working with him for quite a few years, not on the interpretation because I'm nowhere near, but I, I just format his stuff for the internet. So um, right. uh, now as to the uh, covenant creation, I'm, um, you know, I made a statement. I don't know if you read it on the covenant creation forum because I'm, I'm listening and it seems to me it's an idea in search of biblical justification. <laughs> Um, because it's just, is it me or, or has that movement already developed some people that are like out there that are just, you know? Yeah. Every movement has its crazies. There yeah. But I know this is relatively new. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I know. Um, I've been, a, I've been the crazy sometimes, but you know, I was just wondering because it seems like this, some people are adding in a whole bunch of stuff and then, uh, Tim Martin or is it Tim Martin? Or Jim, Jim Martin? Uh, Tim Martin, you're correct. Tim Martin, yeah. Uh, sometimes he'll come in and, you know, you can see that he doesn't quite agree with that, you know. And I, I to me, it's confusing enough. Just <laughs> if it's taught just on its face, it's confusing enough. Uh, because you essentially have to remove all of the, your understanding of the text. You know, you're saying the text means this, the text means that. It's no longer just about the text. It's about what people are saying the text meant because of this writing and that writing and this writing. You know what I mean? So it's, it's really complicated to learn. Let me put it that way. Um, so, um, it, you know, I just wondered, I'm, that's why I'm having a problem with it. I'm, I'm not seeing, um, I'm just, I just can't draw all these connections that are being drawn, you know? It seems yeah. Like I, I can understand that. I, I will say that, you know, one of the things we mentioned before, I know you were tuned in, is we talked about the reset. I do believe that. I believe there needs to be a, a, a reset because I believe there's a lot of junk that has been foisted upon Genesis. So I, I think there needs to, you know, we need to start at ground level. Now, again, as you're probably noticing, there's quite a few different ways the people at ground level are trying to frame what ground level is. And that does become confusing. And, uh, you know, so for me, if I may just, you know, the way I usually encourage people to go about this study is read the book Beyond Creation Science first. And you'll notice if you've done that work is there's plenty of things the book doesn't endeavor to respond to uh, that, you know, there's a lot of area where it's just leaving it. Well, that's something you might have to study and come to a conviction on your own, which many have. And then what ends up happening, as you probably noticed, is you get three or four different views being foisted, kind of molded together and saying, this is covenant creation. Well, that's not true. That's a couple different men uh, and women for that matter, coming together with their ideas of what covenant creation might be pointing to. But the very foundation of covenant creation is simply saying the way that we've looked at Genesis through this natural lens that's talking about the creation of the physical world or physical creation for that matter, man and woman uh, is erroneous. Yeah. So yeah. that's yeah. the foundation. Now, again, that is an undoing. Let's face it. That's a reset right there. So what's being built on on top of that? I, I, you know, it is tricky because I do know there's different resources out there, different men. For example, I know you can have Randall Nuss say one thing and then Tim Martin and Jeff Vaughn will say something a little bit different uh, or quite a bit different, maybe even the opposite. Then you'll have me join in on that equation and then I say something else. So there is some confusion and uh, you know, I think that happens when you have these areas, like, for example, with preterism, we see the same thing. We yeah. see there's a lot of, you know, good clarity, but then there's a lot of confusion in a lot of different sticky places, you know, the millennium, resurrection. Uh, so, again, I, I think it's a, it's something that needs to take time. I see value in the things that uh, that they're highlighting that are correct. And there's areas where I've read some things on Facebook and I say, oof, you know, a matter of fact, I'm being dragged in on a current conversation that I will be responding to. Uh, in regards to morality and you know what are we saying then if uh, we're, we're pointing out it's all covenantal and you know we're we're removing certain texts from application uh, then what are we saying as far as morality so uh, that's coming into a covenant creation view somehow so i look forward to responding to that so again i think there's a lot of areas uh, that there's different a variety of different thought richard and i hope that what i just said maybe clarified some things but 
also highlighted that, yeah, there's distinct views that not everyone that holds to a covenant creation view would agree with. Yeah, well, what I what I noticed was, I mean, I've read uh, uh, Beyond Creation Science uh, twice. And I, you know, I didn't have any problem. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't see any big, uh, you know, I, I, first of all, I've already had come to the conclusion that it was most likely a local flood. Uh, as to the age of the earth, I don't think science even dates things properly yet. Uh, so I don't have a problem. Some people say young earth, you know, it really doesn't matter to me, <laughs> quite frankly. That's not an issue I'm going to get upset about, you know. Um, so, and I, you know, I read the book twice and I'm saying, I, what, what is the big controversy here? But when I started to get into um, the Preterist Power Hour and I heard a few people really getting into more detail, I'm saying, wait a minute, now that wasn't all in Beyond Creation Science, <laughs> you know? And that's what kind of confused me. I said, but I don't see all this in the book Beyond Creation Science, you know? Um, so that's what kind of confuses me. And it seems to me, I'm reading some, you know, I'm reading some stuff now because I, I, I'm watching the forum and I read some of it and I say, oh my God, you know, it's like, yeah. uh, you know, I don't even know if I want to ever, you know, mention you know, coming to creation, if this is where it's going, you know what I'm saying? So um, I keep, I'm keeping my mind open. Uh, I really am because, the, you know, I can understand every so often I get a glimpse about when people talk about the beauty of it all. Like if you can show from Genesis to Revelation in a very clear way, I just not sure that we can do that without doing a lot of assumptions with the text, you know, uh, that, that's, that's all I have to say, but who knows what I'll be saying a year from now. <laughs> you know, so maybe I'll... I think, uh, you know, I did want to respond and maybe we'll conclude on the point there, unless Zach wants to say anything, I'll uh, keep it uh, that open. However, um, what I will say is that you mentioned it being complicated. Now, I do hear that from some folks in, in regards to teaching the Bible. Uh, obviously, I serve in a capacity where I pretty much spend my entire life teaching the Bible, which is a blessing and, and a burden sometimes. Uh, let's call it what it is. However, that being said, uh, I, I do hear people say things like, wow, this is very confusing. And uh, there, there are times where things are going to be confusing in our understanding of things, especially, I would often argue, especially if we're looking at writings that are over 10,000 years old. So uh, there's things that are just foreign to us. And then there's things that are, we, we believe that because of the world we lived in, things we've taught, been taught, that we, that we're, we don't let go of very easily, and sometimes rightly so. Uh, but if that's the battle, is figuring out what things do we let go of, what things do we not let go of, what things do we add to our view, what things do we not add? Uh, and, and I think that's a constant challenge for each of us. Uh, that always reminds me of that quote by J.I. Packer, where he says that, you know, we, we can't excuse ourselves the duty of reforming our thoughts according to the scriptures. And obviously, when we say that, uh, we mean the scriptures in their right context, which requires work, because we're not living 2,000, 10,000 years ago. Uh, so, you know, and I know Richard believes that and agrees with that as well. So it's, it's such, just something we need to take our time uh, the good news is I'm not aware of any covenant creationists that, you know, uh, hereticize uh, those that believe in a different view. Uh, I'm glad to say I think the Christian church is not too harsh on different views of covenant creation. Uh, depends who you talk to, of course. <laughs> so that being said, uh, I hope that we've urged you toward study this morning, that you would examine your views, that you would desire toward a consistent understanding of the Bible. But yes, being honest, as Richard noted, uh, it's not as easy as we want to pretend it to be. So uh, let's be patient. We talked about that yesterday and the day before. Let's be patient with each other. Let's encourage one another. Let's study to show ourselves approved, walking worthy of that ethics, seeking, searching, studying, and proving, which I believe is how we sanctify Christ in our heart. And I'm not just talking about doctrine in the Bible. I'm talking about seeking God's work in our lives, searching, what is he doing in me? What is he testing me in? How is he disciplining me? Studying scriptures, studying other writings to help us understand our, our worldview and our how we're responding to different truths and proving, you know, marking out. These are the things I believe. This is what I believe is right. These are the things that I think are wrong. I think if we do that, we truly walk worthy of sanctifying Christ in our hearts. So thank you for your time this morning. Tomorrow, we're obviously going to be talking about the Feast of the Lord, as many of you know, uh, that tomorrow evening when you see the sun go down, that is the beginning of the celebration of Passover for the Jewish community. Uh, we have a resource, an ongoing resource in regards to the Feast of the Lord that we'll be highlighting tomorrow, maybe even welcoming some thoughts from others in regards to uh, other speakers, other guests uh, in regards to the Feast of the Lord and what we should be looking at and talking about and thinking about as the Jews welcome 
excuse me, welcome Passover. So thank you very much. Go in peace. I'll go ahead and pray us out. And I thank you for being here. Tomorrow we'll be here live again at 11 a.m. Mighty God, we do thank you for the privilege to gather around your name this morning, gather around your truth, to ponder and think about what we're saying about your kingdom, Lord, and how we're bringing forth that ethic. Uh, Lord, we thank, we thank you for what you've provided. We thank you for your ever-increasing kingdom. We thank you for clarity. We thank you for healing. We thank you for the strategy you provide, Lord, as you continue to compel us to teach the truth and love. Uh, Lord, that we would walk worthy of each of us walk worthy of our call to be a minister, uh, where we would uh, mark out, you know, we would encourage the saints in sound doctrine, and we would rebuke those who oppose it. Lord, we thank you for your strength, your righteousness, your reasonableness, that we would understand salvation, and we give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless and go in peace.